my guys. Well, it is almost starting to feel like a winter night here, finally. Here on the second day of winter, and that would be, what is it, Tuesday night, December 22nd, 2021, as the, uh, looking at 37 degrees tonight here in the Point Lonesome Swamp in the uh, Oasis of Freedom, so, uh, while I enjoy my sunset margarita huddled here under some warmth, I'm going to uh, we're going to head over to our friends with those little lefties over at Common Dreams today to see what's on the minds of folks over at Common Dreams, and we're going to hear from a fellow I've never heard of. He's kind of a uh, I guess you would kind of call him a doomsday author. I think this guy is a actually a novelist, and I don't know if this is what fiction or not that he's going to share with us. This is a fellow named John Pfeffer. John Pfeffer, and what John is going to do for us today is he's going to help us debunk the eternal economic growth model. Asking the question and hopefully answering it, can those who advocate hitting the brakes on economic growth get their message across before it is too late? And of course, the short answer of the question is no, those who advocate hitting the brakes on economic growth cannot get their message across before it's too late, but I'm sure that John has uh, a more lengthy answer to that. He has a very lengthy answer with a little bit of hopium at the end, so we're not going to go all the way to the end. I'm going to probably have time to read uh, about two-thirds of this excellent article before the hopium creeps in. and. Uh, he interviews William Reese, among other people, for this. Take it away, John Pfeffer. <clears throat> Over the last three decades, a growing number of scientists and ecologists have argued that economic growth has long outstripped the capacity of our planetary ecosystem. They have developed numerous sophisticated models to demonstrate their point. They have boiled down the technical information about the availability of mineral resources, the limits of energy generation, the constraints of food production, the effects of biodiversity loss, and, of course, the impact of climate change into accessible texts. They have lobbied governments and they have crafted sound bites for the media. Despite these efforts, economic growth remains at the heart of virtually every government's national policy. Even the various Green New Deals that have been put forward around the world are wedded two notions of economic expansion. At the heart of these more recent attempts to bring carbon emissions under control is the concept of green growth, which has become the current mantra. So, inevitably, advocates of degrowth have addressed this new version of sustainable economic expansion. There you go. I think that I have interviewed this fellow, Brian Check, C-Z-E-C-H, uh, before. I'm pretty sure I've interviewed Brian, the founder of the Center for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy. Quote, we have to continue to pound away with articles in social media 
to dispel that fuzzy and oxymoronic notion of green growth, that there is no conflict between growing the economy and protecting the environment, close quote. Yes, the evidence that economic growth is associated not only with climate change, but all the other ills of resource depletion is overwhelming. But evidence is not enough. This is uh, ecological economist Catherine Farrell. Quote, <clears throat> When we look at the discourses at the international and even the national level, the recourse to the evidence is not what is necessarily moving the argument. Huh. We need to reflect on why the evidence that exists is not being taken into account. Close quote. There are several reasons why the evidence in favor of degrowth has not been persuasive to policymakers or the public. One challenge has been non-rational fears of a world no longer governed by economic expansion. This is Marga Metavia, systems engineer, uh, blah, 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 from Spain, quote, maybe we have to sit with people and ask them what they are of a, afraid of if there is no technological solution, if there is no growth. What are their fears? It is also difficult against a prevailing consensus particularly given the risks of exclusion. This is Simon Michel, geologist with the Geological Survey of Finland. Quote, the very thought of being rejected will convince us to self-censor. We will not look at certain ideas and thought patterns. We will censor what we say based on what we think the rest of the group thinks so that we don't get pushed into an outside group." Close quote. The complexity of the problem poses certain challenges as well. And now we get to hear uh, bioecologist William Reese from the University of British Columbia talking about the complexity of the problem. Quote, we tend to be reductionist in our thinking. We tend to choose one issue at a time to focus on and we lose sight of the overall picture. You can hardly get people to connect the dots to see climate change, biodiversity loss, the corona panic, ocean pollution, and climate change as all symptoms of overshoot, close quote. And then there is the flood of messaging that supports economic growth coming from all sides, government, media, even the entertainment industry. This is ecological economist Joshua Farley, who I have also interviewed somewhere on. This sounds like a, a lot of these people I've interviewed, so if you want to go check my interviews, this one. So I interviewed Joshua a while back. Um, there is a huge fire hydrant blasting people. We are an eyedropper trying to give them an alternative." Close quote. Yes. Nevertheless, proponents of degrowth have been developing more sophisticated communi 
communication strategies to sell their ideas. And they have been translating those ideas into specific policy recommendations and platforms that are gaining greater traction in the public sphere. The question is whether they can overcome the aforementioned challenges to change public opinion and public policy in time to avert catastrophe. And of course, the answer to that question, as we all know, is no, because uh, that would have had to have happened about 30 years ago. But anyway, getting back uh, to today's chronicle, <clears throat> human beings behave rationally some of the time. We analyze the situation make calculations based on carefully considered evidence, and then act accordingly. On some occasions, the rest of the time we fly blind, guided by instinct, emotion, and other non-rational factors. <coughs> this is, I uh, can't remember who Catherine Farrell is, quote, according to social psychologists, human beings don't behave rationally. It is necessary to communicate with people whose priorities are very different from ours and who are not necessarily paying much attention to the arguments, close quote. Yeah, that's the first thing. Imagine walking into a room full of people and saying, okay, folks, uh, let's cut the chit chat and start talking about overshoot and the circular economy and uh, see how fast you will clean the room out. My guess is that uh, it, it, if if 50 people on common dreams are even reading this, my guess this is the single least read story on common dreams today. All right. According to neuro, neuroscientists, the brain has evolved over time by adding functions. The older parts of the brain, often referred to as reptilian, or limbic now coexist with the regions of higher functioning in the neocortex, observes William Reese, quote, we live in our, W-A-S-F, in our cerebral neocortex as rational individuals, and we think that is where the action takes place but all of our actions are filtered through the limbic. The bottom line is this. The rational component is often overridden by emotion and instinct. This happens unconsciously. We can, th we can think that we're acting rationally, particularly in relation to other people, when in fact, we're acting out of self-defense mechanisms that arise when our social status or political opinions or other aspects of our identity are threatened. This was highly adaptive as little as 10,000 years ago when things didn't change much, but it is maladaptive today when we have to respond to a rapidly changing context. It's not all in the mind either, Catherine Farrell adds, quote, there has been a lot of work in the brain science that, that has brought in the stomach and the body, which brings us back to the holistic nature of human existence 
for instance, in English, we say it's a gut decision. It is a gut decision after being down this rabbit hole uh, for going on uh, how many years, I've, 12 years I've been down in this rabbit hole. It is a gut decision that we're screwed. It's, I think, what she's saying. The challenge, Marga Medea Via clarifies, is not with emotions or instincts per se. Quote, the problem is that rationally we are seeing a problem that the instincts don't want to see. Yes. What we need is coherence among the three levels with feelings, instincts, and rationality all working together, close quote. William Reese agrees, quote, I was not suggesting, suggesting that there is anything wrong with emotions or instinct, but often they are in conflict with what our rational analyses tells us. If you believe a certain thing emotionally and are confronted with contrary information, it can be very difficult to accept alternative information, close quote, which is all oh, this is a long way of saying people do not want to hear it. Damn! Went down the wrong pipe. <clears throat> <coughs> well, once I get my voice back, it is one thing when, in, when individuals are struggling in their own minds and indeed throughout their own bodies to reconcile emotionally felt convictions with a set of fact-based assertions. This struggle becomes considerably more complex when it intersects with group dynamics. You know, like first, first you have to, you know, believe it yourself, and then you have to get anybody else to believe all of your crazy ideas that first you have to understand we cannot have infinite growth on a finite planet. Once you've gotten that through your head, good luck explaining that to all of the clueless morons who have never considered it and you tell them you cannot have infinite growth on a finite planet and they look at you like you're a space alien, you know, mumbling gibberish and off they go to talk about, I don't know, the O word. Anyway, <clears throat> for instance, an individual might conclude based on available evidence that the sky is about to fall. But the community where the individual lives dismisses this conclusion for no other reason than it goes against received notions. Should the individual go public with the evidence based on rational observation and data collection, or should the whistleblower keep quiet out of fear of ridicule? I think it's obvious which choice I have made in my life, Mr. Chicken Little. Getting back to Joshua Farley, <clears throat> quote, Humans are entirely social. We cannot survive apart from the group. So being part of the group is the most rational thing to do. From an evolutionary point of view, to signify that you are part of the group <clears throat> is often to believe in crazy shit. Believing in crazy shit helps you stay alive. 
rational science is good for the next 50 years, but if you're not part of a group, you're dead in a few weeks in evolutionary terms, close quote. Yep, yep, yep. <clears throat> this group mentality applies to everyone, from scientists to those who belong to, you know, all sorts of, uh, uh, whatever. Your, pick your group. Uh, doomers, whatever. <clears throat> it has been shaped by our evolved neurobiology, William Reese points out, and it forms our identity from an early age. Quote, every group has ingrained but socially constructed beliefs that distinguish the in-group from the out-group. This is absolutely the case for scientists as well as those who are religious and those who oppose everything we support. We are part of our tribes and we seek out people and experiences that reinforce the way we think, close quote. You know, and you can certainly say this about the echo chamber of the Doomosphere. Uh, you know, the, the Doomers, we're just one group and we are an out group. We are outliers. Anyone who believes that we are in overshoot and that you cannot have infinite growth on a finite planet is in an outlier group. We are the ones claiming the sky is falling when no one wants to hear it. <clears throat> Simon Michel uh, provides an example of the challenges of groupthink from his involvement in a meeting on sustainable development within the European Commission in Brussels. Quote, there were CEOs, ministers, lots of bigwigs impressed with their own opinions. They were getting up and saying that they want to take the world to a more sustainable place. I stood up and made two observations. First, I said that all industrial products in Europe depend on raw materials mined from the global south, that the components are manufactured in China or Southeast Asia. All their sustainability rhetoric was lovely and what we should be going toward, but what they were ignoring was where the stuff was coming from. They were saying that we don't mine, it's a dirty business, but they were still buying stuff from China. The second thing I said was that everything on the list they wanted to achieve was achieved by aboriginal cultures thousands of years ago, an outcome that was stabilized for thousands of years. Then European colonialists turned up and destroyed that culture. Can anyone refute those two points, I asked, and the room went silent. At a chemical level, humans are terrified of being rejected and getting punished into an outside group. It is one thing to convince individuals to change their minds. It is no easy task to alter the thought patterns of a group. Morgan Media Via suggests borrowing techniques from social psycho psychology, quote, to get out of this automatic mind, according to psychologists, is to make the unconscious conscious. Once it is conscious, then we can change the behavior. We don't know that we believe in these unconscious beliefs that are causing us problems. It's probably because we are experiencing some kind of trauma. We don't want 
to look at the scarcity of minerals or planetary limits, we are worried that we might have to go back to a lifestyle that is not as comfortable as today, but our beliefs are preventing us from having a better relationship with nature." Close quote. Catherine Farrell notes that colonialism is another trauma that affects groupthink. When someone calls that colonial narrative into question, as Simon Michel did, quote, the audience becomes uncomfortable. If they can ignore you, they will. She also offers a powerful reminder that the group identity of humans derives from different sources. Quote, gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos, these are the primates closest to us. Bonobos manage all of their relations through sex, compassion, and love. They are generally quite timid and form a small and isolated population. Gorillas and chimps, on the other hand, are among the most violent animals on the planet, and we are more violent than they are." Close quote. I didn't really realize that gorillas were uh, that violent. <clears throat> One way of overcoming groupthink based on faulty information or deeply held erroneous beliefs is to patiently establish new patterns of thinking through social learning by way of educational systems, government programs, advocacy campaigns, and the like. And we all see what the good that does. I was just reporting, you know, recently on on, on how many studies are showing that facts, that showing people facts is the single worst way you can uh, get anybody to change their minds by showing them what you consider to be facts. It will make them double down on what they consider to be facts, and the th fact is you're probably both wrong with your facts. Okay, but as uh, William Reese will uh, let us in on, the second path is through a shock to the system, and that's what we're, we're going to get. It's called pulling your head out of your you-know-where. According to uh, Dr. Reese, people will remain in climate denial until they are up to their knees in water. Here in Canada, we experienced a record heat wave this summer, registering the second highest temperature in the world. It was the worst wildfire season on record, and now we're having the wettest November in the history of the country. In the last two weeks, the water has pushed 17,000 people off their farms and killed so many farm animals. It has been an absolute catastrophe. A lot of people said they did not believe in climate change until now. They didn't believe it until it's right in their face. Reese adds that these catastrophes are straining the budgets of governments, quote, which are already stretched to the limit bailing us out of corona panic. It won't be long before all the money in the economy will be devoted to repairing the damage done because of the O word. Gotcha! Overshoot. Absent a shock to the system, which, uh, believe me, 
there will be more shocks to the system than we've ever seen in any hundred year period in human history, it can be difficult to persuade others of the perils of resource depletion and ecological overshoot because of the sheer complexity of the issue. Says Margra Medea Via, quote, climate change is only one aspect of unsustainability. The world is now focused on climate change, but we face other pr problems like the depletion of resources. When you put them together, it's possible to see the whole picture of unsustainability." Close quote. <clears throat> William Reese agrees. Last year it was the corona panic. What do you mean last year, brother? Uh, it, will, uh, it will continue to be the corona panic. I anyway, before that, <clears throat> it was climate change, and before that, it was the economy. The human brain evolved in very simple times when you only had a few people to deal with and you lived in a relatively small space that you could not influence that much. There has been no natural selection to think in systems terms. Humans cannot anticipate the nature of behavior of most complex systems. We don't know about thresholds and tipping points until they occur. The COP negotiators who were policy wonks, economists, and politicians, not climate scientists, had no real understanding of the complexity of interacting climate economic and ecosphere systems, or else they would not have come to the conclusions they came to, which of course were no conclusions at all. Add Simon Michel, quote, most people don't even know what steady state means. When they talk about the circular economy, it's all about using things better. They talk about the value chain, manufacture, consumption, waste management, recycling, and back to manufacture. Then they say, hooray, we've done our job, and now we can have a nice lie down. They don't touch the inner ring of money, energy, and information systems. They think that world resources are infinite, that the ecosystem is fine, and it's just an economic problem. They have an attention span of 30 seconds. You have to convince them in 30 seconds before they move on to the next challenge. Close quote. Complexity at an individual level is certainly a challenge, agrees Catherine Farrell. Quote, the basic neurological functioning of a human being, which developed in stages, requires a certain amount of maturity to handle contradictions, which is the beginning of complexity. But complexity is a different matter at a communal level. The culture of consumption is just one culture. Analysis, the breaking into parts, is a trick of modern industrialized science and technology whereby we are able to isolate certain aspects of physics and subject them to our will, and in the process of getting so obsessed with the toys, lose sight of the operator of the toys. But other cultures deal with cyclical knowledge 
and complex dynamics, and it is incomplete to assume that complexity is the opposite of oversimplifying things. The complexity of a haiku is phenomenal. And anyway, guys, this goes on and on and on. Uh, we have a little bit of hopium. I will put the link on here. I am about half way through. So anyway, who is John Pfeffer? John Pfeffer is the author of the dystopian novel Splinterhead, Splinterheads and the director of foreign policy in focus, po uh, foreign policy in focus at the Institute for Policy Studies. Anyway, so if you want to uh, pick up from where I left off and find the rest of the story, you can go on the link, but I am uh, getting a little bit chilly out here in, uh, in the outdoor kitchen. And it's starting to feel like a winter evening. <clears throat> so I gotta feed my little dog and uh, find me a nice warm, some sort of heater to go huddle in front of. And go watch a Netflix movie. Bye guys. <clears throat>